Uh, they're figuring out ways to cram as much sugar and fat into the average American diet. So I'm sneaking and overeating all week and then being rewarded with really crappy processed food. So, uh, you know, for so many years, I ate until I couldn't eat anymore. And that's what I thought, like, okay, now I'm done. Today, I sit down with Ethan Suplee, typecast in Hollywood as the big guy in shows like My Name is Earl and films like Remember the Titans. Today, he talks about the five lessons that he learned on his 300 pound weight loss journey and how you can apply them into your life. Today's video was sponsored by Mullingmurs.com, the best motivational clothing brand in the world where you can now get the workout gear and so much more with the link in the description where all the profits go back into making these projects. But before that, let's jump into one of the greatest weight loss journeys ever and the five lessons that Ethan Suplee learned from it. I'm your host, Jordan Mulligan. Let's jump into the video. I, I, could, I can lose weight fast. Yeah. I can't do it in a healthy manner, right. usually. And because of that, it usually got, comes back on. Yeah faster than it you know and i and i think that's a, a very common thing especially like and i, I think it's so odd it, it's it's kind of odd but also our normal and so our normal when you put it into any kind of historical context to me it seems very odd that for the first time and you know i say the first time but it's really the last 50 years but for the first time ever in human history we have a massive surplus of food and I know that people starve to death still today. That's largely due to, or maybe even entirely due to political reasons where food is being withheld to certain groups. So if that wasn't the case, really nobody would starve to death today. But in the West, um, we are so wealthy and, and have such an abundance of cheap calories that you see that the entire population is getting obese. Um, and like, you know, if it was 200 years ago, we would all just be kings and we'd be very happy with that, right? While the rest of the world starved, we would be kings. And and we're not really, we're, you have this obesity occurring um, and, and you have simultaneous obesity and malnourishment, which is, really wild to wrap your head around. So he's getting so many calories that he's fat, but he's not getting the kind of micronutrients he needs. So he's actually sickly because of it, you know? So there's a lot of weird things in there to take into consideration. I think the majority of food that's consumed is highly processed, um, calorie dense and uh, nutritionally void or devoid of nutritional value. So we have like, uh, we're eating a lot of uh, food that is, is uh, they're figuring out ways to cram as much sugar and fat, basically, and as little protein into uh, the average American diet as possible, because that's really the cheapest way to feed people. Um, and so, you know, we are getting larger and larger and uh and it's getting to be the younger and younger people too so we have um type 2 which is uh you know that they differentiate diabetes there's juvenile diabetes or type 1 diabetes which is uh, an autoimmune disease and then there's basically a type of diabetes where you have fed your body um food that really isn't built for your body over a really long period of time and you wear down your body's ability to um, basically take the carbohydrates and get them into the cells for use as energy uh, and that forever was only seen in adults or, or older people and now we have a, a massive amount of young kids with that because the food they're eating is um, harming them well I, I mean I was put on a restrictive diet as a very, very young kid. So at like five years old, I was put on a restrictive diet. And uh, we, I grew up in Los Angeles. And so we were the, you know, the, the vanguard of every fad diet that ev has ever existed. Um, basically, you know, sparked or kicked off in Los Angeles. Um, and for the most part, 
we ate from like the health food stores. And when I was a little kid, the health food stores were like Sikhs, you know, with turbans or who were vegetarians, which there weren't that many vegetarians back then, or uh, people who looked like they were dying from cancer, right? Were the people that shopped at health food stores. And, and then my mom would go in there going like, well, we got to fix Ethan because there's something wrong with him. So if we just feed him this healthy food, but you know, I didn't want to be on a diet when I was five. And so my workaround for this was just like, I would just sneak food and cheat on my diet. Um, and then if my mother and father perceived that I had a successful week of dieting, my treat would be going to the drive through like a McDonald's or something like that and having this really unhealthy meal. So I'm sneaking and overeating all week and then being rewarded with really crappy processed food. So, uh, you know, my uh, whole relationship with food from the time I was very young was skewed in that way. Like food was a reward and food was also something to be compulsively overeaten in private because it was being withheld from me in public. When we were young kids, like hopefully our parents were serving us portions that were appropriate for us that were mostly meals that were cooked at home. So that I automatically associate with being healthier. It doesn't necessarily mean it is, but but so I, I get that, like I have four kids and like I remember when they were young, if I was serving them, you know, some kind of protein and some vegetables and a starch, I'm not just giving them a giant dish of whatever and saying, eat until you're full. I'm making them a plate of food and serving it to them. So the idea there is like, yeah, you got to eat all this and maybe, you know, unfortunately, I wish I hadn't done this, but give them some reward of like a, a sweet thing at the end of dinner if you finish your plate. Now we, and I'm sure it was like this to some degree when I was a kid, and it was certainly like this when my kids were kids, but food is so cheap now that in America, in Europe, and, and you know, we're having this interview like right on the precipice of when there could be a food shortage because of like global catastrophic uh, wars and stuff like so who knows maybe a year from now this will be completely irrelevant because there will be people starving again right like that's possible too I guess but as of today food is basically so inexpensive that you go out to eat and the portions are like astronomically big and so packed with fat and sugar that it's like hard for anybody to process that mm. Yeah, I, I agree. I, like, and, and I think that's, that's the, where we're at now is that I think it's, it's, it's healthy to finish your food. The portion size is the, the problem because right. with the conditioning, you're finishing gigantic portion. Do you remember specifically as a, as a child, like what, what snacks, like a list? This is mainly for the edit, but like what that would look like. Um, well, I, I remember going to friends' houses and and I would be in awe that friends of mine would have like, you know, sugar cereal or soda or anything like that because we weren't allowed to have that in my house. Snacks were, you know, largely just what my mom got at the health food store. So she would get a brand of, you know, that was the other thing that was not really taken into consideration by her. If you buy a box of cookies from the health food store, and they have just as many calories as a box of, you know, brand name uh, cookies, but they're made with like better sugar. And this, like, if the ca caloric value is the same, you're still going to be overeating if you eat too many cookies, right? It doesn't really matter if the food is quote unquote healthy. So I think that was the, the main problem I had. It's like in my house, we had mostly like, quote unquote healthy food, but because it was restricted to me, I would then go and binge eat it out of sight. Um, and, and, you know, uh, all the normal stuff kids ate, crackers, cookies, uh, chicken nuggets, all of that stuff. It was just kind of disguised with this idea of being healthy. Yeah, I, I think that I, th I think it's better now, but I remember when oh, it's, it's, it, we're just talking about veganism. Like, you can have a vegan burger with more calories in it than than lean steak burger or whatever you know, lean beef burger. 
Um, There's this crazy thing now too, like keto is super popular and, and um, you can go to the to the grocery store and, and there's a brand of ice cream I really like and they have a, a keto version and a low calorie version and the keto version has as many calories as a regular pint of ice cream and I, I, I don't understand why anybody would eat this and think that they were doing themselves a service you know it's not to the benefit of a restrictive diet yeah a lot of brandings go like a lot of marketing a lot of branding it is it doesn't make sense it, it, well you know, each to their own again, but sure. yeah, of course. But I imagine that if you're, if you're making this determination, like I'm eating in a way in order to lose weight and you're not losing weight, chances are that, you know, just this moniker of keto or vegan doesn't necessarily mean you're going to lose weight, right? Like that isn't a diet that is designed necessarily for weight loss in the way that it's practiced in the mainstream. Yeah, I, I've been an obese vegan, <laughs> an obese meat eater as well. Like, it didn't make much of a difference to me. Yeah. Um, so, do you remember when you were a child, what the... I know you said, like, uh, you were eating those healthy foods and then you would cheat on, on them. Was For me, I remember finding I was always a bit bigger and that always made me a little bit sad. So then I'd eat. That was my cycle. But, like, do you, do you remember what your hook was? Like... My hook was, yeah, I mean, there was for sure comfort in food and there and there and it got to be the point where there was a comfort in the the discomfort of overeating. So the minute that I would um, be so full, I couldn't eat anymore. So full, I had to lay down and like rest. That was when I felt satiated. Right. So I, I kind of like trampled all, on all my physical cues of what an appetite is and 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 I still have trouble with that. I still have to take a plate of food that's portioned appropriately and go, I want to I want to know what it feels like in my body once I've eaten this. And I want to be aware of that. Right. Because I, because I'm really not because for so many years I ate until I couldn't eat anymore. And that's what I thought, like, OK, now I'm done, like another bite and I'm going to throw up. You know, there's a great. Um, Monty Python sketch where the guy goes to the buffet and he's eating and he's eating, he's getting fatter and fatter and and he eats everything and then the the waiter comes out and says, Do you want a mint? And he says, No, no, I'm I'm done. And he says, Okay, I'll have a mint. And he eats the mint and explodes, right? Like that was what for me that that spoke to me simply because that was the the point where I associated with being done eating, right? When I was so full, I literally couldn't eat anymore. Thank you so much to Ethan for sharing these lessons with us today. Which one was your favorite? Which one do you relate to? Comment down below. Ethan's stuff is also gonna be linked down below. Go check it out. The podcast, American Glutton, is a free resource that Ethan does on a weekly basis where you can check out other people's stories, all from around America, famous people, not so famous people, psychologists, therapists, and their journey with gluttony and uh, weight loss in America. So go check that out, it's linked down below. Today's video was made possible by mulliganbrothers.com, the best motivational clothing brand in the world, where you can now get all the workout gear, the Inspire Change t-shirts, and so much more where all the profits go back into making these projects possible and we can't thank you guys enough for all the support we've had so far. Guys, go inspire change by moving forward with passion and purpose in whatever you are doing. People are watching, remember that. People are being inspired by you on a daily basis. You might not even recognize that you're inspiring people, but if you're moving forward with passion and purpose, you will be inspiring people. Have a blessed and productive day. Go follow me on Instagram, hit the notification bell, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one.